Welcome to the latest installment of Simple Flying's Future Flying series, where we look at the future technologies that are influencing aviation today. Um, so today I'm really excited to speak to Georgia Lafniov, who is the CEO of a company called Jecta. Um, I don't know if you guys will have heard of Jecta, but we're going to dive into it. It's an electric seaplane. Um, so yeah, I'm really excited to find out more about this development. George, welcome to the show. Thank you very much for the invitation, Joanna. It's a pleasure to be here. It's great to talk to you. So tell me a bit about your background and what brought you to Jecta. Yes. Um, one can say it uh, runs in a family because uh, my father is a navigator. He is an explorer, uh, aircraft designer, and that's what he's been doing all, uh, for the last 20 years is uh, designing and flying amphibian aircraft, seaplanes what we call them, but uh, I think more pre precisely is to say amphibian aircraft because they are designed not only to operate on the water, but also equally operate on land. So as someone who was around uh, aviation airplanes uh, since he was six years old, I think it was uh, only natural that, uh, that I would go into the aviation and together with my father. Um, I have a background of education uh, of international relations, business and law, very far away from uh, aviation engineering. After, after having a successful career in, uh, in trading, um, I went to commercial aviation as, a, as an investor um, or, and until the, the arrival of the pandemic, uh, I was a managing partner of a low cost airline was the first uh, low-cost airline operator of A220 aircraft in Central Asia. And uh, it was actually my job to uh, change completely, overhaul the park of the legacy aircraft uh, for this uh, new A220 aircraft, which also gave me great insight in how the operators work and what they're looking into when they're choosing the aircraft and uh, uh, how they're looking at the economical uh, part of the, of the aviation ownership of aircraft ownership. After that, uh, and after the pandemic, which unfortunately touched all business uh, in aviation, including us, um, I made a decision to go back and uh, start this company together with my father in 2029, um, using all the experience and the knowledge that have been accumulated over the last 20 years to design the first ever uh, 19 passenger amphibian aircraft. And that brings us to where we are today, where you've got a design on the table for exactly that, a 19-seat amphibious aircraft, flying boat, whatever you like to call yes. it. Um, and you call this airplane the PHA-ZE100. Mm -hmm. Can we call it the Phase 100? Is that like that, the shorthand for it? That's that's the intention. So what was your purpose when you set out with the, the Phase 100? What, what was um, the opportunity that you saw? Well... Uh, Actually, working within within the amphibian aircraft business and helping my father for the last twenty years, uh, what we've realized is that there is uh, this quite a big segment of the market for amphibious and seaplane aircraft, but today it's serviced uh, by uh, two legacy aircraft. One has been the Viking Air Twin Otter, which was designed in nineteen sixty seven. The other one is famous Cessna Caravan. Uh, designed in 1984, if I'm not mistaken. Um, so being in, in 2020s, uh, it's kind of surprising that um, we don't see any new uh, redesigned and modernized uh, aircraft. Despite that those two are great legacy aircraft, they're already unfortunately outdated, uh, whether it's through materials, whether through uh, power planes used, um, it has certain uh, limitations in terms of operations because of its design and floater design, et cetera, et cetera, which makes it very expensive and very difficult for the operators around the world to use this aircraft um, in an economical way. Working and, and talking with a lot of operators, we realized that there is a, actually a need for new 19th century aircraft. Uh, of course, at that point, what we were thinking is uh, building a combustion engine, uh, a classic aircraft on two uh, PT-6 engines. Um, and uh, this was about the time three years ago uh, where we saw that there is new technologies coming in, new uh, 
aircraft manufacturers coming in and uh, starting building electric aircraft. So we just decided to take a look and see if there's any advantages or disadvantages in order to um, design this 19C amphibian aircraft with electric propulsion. What we found to our biggest surprise that the A technology is already there to supply uh, electric aircraft for these particular needs uh, because uh, seaplane market generally, whether it's water to water or land to water, has a very short distance travels, average of 84 kilometers, which shows us that the the battery technology on the present level can already is sufficient enough to cover maybe 80, 85 percent of those uh, of those flights. Now, on the other side, the advantages of making amphibious aircraft in terms of reducing direct operating costs are so huge that it provides a direct economic benefit to our operators. Combining all to, to all this together, which is the need for the of the market for the new aircraft, the technology that is available, and the economical benefit that electrification of amphibian aircraft will bring, pushed us to to understanding that uh, this is something that market wants, and this is definitely something that market needs, and this is something that we can uh, we can design and supply. Uh, that is only if we're talking about the existing operators. Now, another very important factor to it is we are uh, when we look at the map we see that the, there is a billions of people uh, living in the coastlines and on the islands whether it's uh, indonesia whether it's africa south america or maybe key west um and while the so-called developed world uh the passenger can afford to pay quite substantial amount of money to travel on the seaplanes because using those twin orders and use those caravans is quite expensive. Uh, and these costs are certainly laid down on the passenger. That a developing world where we have a billion people between China and Australia, for example, Indonesia, Philippines, and or one and a half billion people in India we have right now. Um, they're a little bit less fortunate in the terms that they're not able to afford uh, flying short distance or regional travel with those two aircraft. Now, when we're talking about direct uh, reducing direct operating costs, what we're saying is that because of that reduction, suddenly this whole market can be expanded to new areas, new countries, and and we're going from uh, a, a quite small passenger flow to possibility of having uh, a 500, 700 million people traveling with uh, with uh, regionally with uh, aviation in particular our aircraft because of those direct reduced direct operational costs and ergo suddenly those that population can afford to pay to buy a ticket for $50 $40 and operator of course can still make a profit on it so we're we're saying that this aircraft can a supply the existing market but it actually can expand X factor this market to the new countries and and just as to the global phenomena and the technology is already there actually to supply it. That's great to hear that there's already the battery technology to get you guys off the ground. So with battery technology as it is right now, how far would you imagine the phase is going to be able to fly? Yeah. At the, at the current technology of 2023, uh, we believe the aircraft will fly about one hour, one hour 10 before it needs the charge. Now, certainly it is our full intention to design the aircraft in a way that as the technology progresses, and we already know the plans of those progress for the battery manufacturers, because they have a very uh, clear path into uh, increasing the density of the batteries and therefore increasing uh, the possibility of endurance of the aircraft. Uh, by the time that the aircraft will come in 2029 or 2030, uh, this will extend to about one and a half hours. Nevertheless, the way we design the aircraft, as the battery technology evolves and will evolve between 5 to 10% a year, any operator or any user or any owner of this aircraft can simply swap old batteries for new batteries, therefore extending the range of the aircraft without needing to change the whole aircraft or making very big capital investments in, in changing the wings or et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Mm. 
This is for same reason why we we ask that why are we placing in unpressurized aircraft on short range? Why are we placing in a bathroom? Very good question, but a trivial question because yes, right now when we fly one hour, probably we don't need a bathroom. But once the aircraft in 20, 15 years are going to fly two, three, four hours, at that point, you already need it. So we're trying to implement a lot of things in the aircraft. And this is just one of those examples, preparing the aircraft for a 50-year lifetime span so that the operator that buys the aircraft today can safely and easily use it in, in 10 years, in 15 years, in 25 years. Mm-hmm. And this is our uh, also one of the main intentions in the design is to Think about the future. Absolutely. I think if a well-designed seaplane is going to go on for a long time, like you say, the caravans, the twin otters, they're still in daily use, despite the fact that they're 40, 50 years old. Um, But, you know, designing a a plane that can sail or a boat that can fly, depending on which way you look at it, I mean, it must not be an easy task. And then you want to electrify that vehicle as well. So you've got water and electricity to deal with, which is obviously yep. an issue. What has been the hardest part of designing this aircraft? As our core team that has been working together for 20 years as a team and with combined experience of maybe 200 years of specifically designing amphibian aircraft with uh, with many of them flying around the world, uh, even today, um, approach to building a 19-seat aircraft, so a, a bigger one, as the biggest one we've done before was eight-seater, um, is very, very similar. We use the same tools and the same approach as we used before. We're not trying to reinvent the wheel. We're actually trying to uh, take what has been done before and a lot of fantastic studies and methodologies have been made in 1920s and 1930s, the golden era, uh, that is... Um, or aerodynamics, hydrodynamics, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. The challenge here is the electric propulsion. And it's not because of the water itself, but because electric propulsion is new. Uh, the battery technologies are new. There are many, many players. It is not a standardized. So this is a challenge. Um, not a lot of countries, or actually most of the countries in the world don't have regulations yet for the use of the electric propulsion, battery propulsion. This is why the advantage is one of the advantages to be in Switzerland, because Switzerland is the first country to start writing operational manuals and operational regulations for electric propulsion aircraft. Mm-hmm. That is why the first electric aircraft was uh, flown here in Switzerland. Um, and this is one of the advantages we have here. And certainly we have, of course, access to uh, cutting edge technologies that come from the Swiss universities. Um, so when we come to challenges, I think the biggest challenge is the electrical propulsion itself, uh, which would require certainly uh, many, many, many hours of testing. Um, but other than that, uh, I think we we are fortunate that we can use everything that we have uh, amassed over 20 years and put it in this aircraft into making the best possible and, may I say, almost perfect uh, seaplane that we can. It certainly looks very interesting. And there's some of the design elements that I'm curious to talk to you about. Um, But let's begin with the props. So the the mock-ups I've seen, you've got multiple props along the leading edge of the wing. Can you explain the design Mm. philosophy behind that? Yes, certainly. Um, As you know, uh, when it comes to design aircraft, it's always uh, about compromise. Uh, The weight is certainly the most important number one factor but there after that we have to we have to take in consideration a lot of other factors so when we're talking about in our case a distributed propulsion system what we are gaining is three things first of all is of course increased safety the 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 fault faulty one engine you can can still still flying horizontally two again you can can still flying etc etc now as you know the chances of a uh, fault of one engine is certain, let's say X. Of two engine is already 0.1 X. Three engine, 0, 0. 0.2. So it's very much geomet- geometrically. And therefore, increasing the amount of engines actually provides a much more safety. Uh, secondly, uh, because of the flow of the air over the wing uh, from those uh, little engines, we are able and equal distribution of it we're able to lift the aircraft much sooner, decreasing the takeoff distance. This will help 
our operators to operate this aircraft in tight areas, whether it's bays or rivers or unprepared paveways in Africa, for example. And this is the second factor for it. And third factor, uh, paradoxically, is the cost. Because what we've calculated it is, it is cheaper for the operator to change four small props than one big prop. Because the price of the props is actually, again, is, is in a G curve. So it's not linear. So the bigger you go, the much more expensive it becomes. Mm. So this is the, the types of decisions that made into saying this is what we need and why we need it. What are the disadvantages? Well, certainly the disadvantage would be the lower speed, airspeed, which again, in our case and within our market is quite irrelevant. If we go from one hour to one hour 10 to reach our destination, it doesn't make such a big difference because the, all the advantages are, are much bigger than the, than the small disadvantage. Certainly, if we would be thinking about the aircraft that flies, let's say five hours or at the distance of thousand kilometers, then the, this, this, this loss in airspeed would be a little bit more substantial and uh, would feel it a little bit more. But in our case, and in our market, it's, it's already relevant. Mm. So each of those props has got its own little electric motor driving it, and each That's of correct. those can be swapped out individually if something goes wrong with that motor. That's correct. That's correct. They can be turned off and uh, or they should they should shut off automatically and uh, the aircraft will continue flying. Moreover, uh, the battery packs that are uh, in the wings, uh, we'll see it will be in the wings. Um, uh, they will be uh, separated by sections and placed in certain containers. Um, certainly with the system, if the container is also in the batteries, is that fault that there is redistribution of power. Uh, but the main ideas here are two. A, one is for safety again, for the thermal runaway. Of course, there's any issue that the container can be shut off and uh, a fire extinguishing system can be um, turned on specifically for that small area. That's number one. And number two is, uh, when I talked about the exchange of the batteries, it is much simpler and easier just to take the container out of the aircraft, which contains not four tons, on a, but let's say 200 kilograms of batteries. So you take it out, you open the container, you swap those batteries, you put it back in. So this segmentation will actually provide uh, convenience for the operators through, uh, and for the technicians of the operators. Mm. So, so when we four tons of batteries in the in the high aspect wings how does it stay balanced then it's actually much better for the balance to oh, rather okay. than place them in the rather than place them in the fuselage because if we do the place them in the fuselage a we would have to put them under the um, under the floor the where we also have the boat there where there's always an impact if it's landing on the water so we would need to reinforce it even harder to prevent piercing or any other possible uh, um, incident. And then it's actually, it disbalances the aircraft. Now, if we're placing two tons on each uh, wing, it balances more because then we can, can, we can play with it and uh, we can balance the aircraft. So it's, uh, uh, yeah, better balance. Fascinating stuff. And it, to look at the boat, I'm still sticking on the design here because I love the way it looks, but I keep calling it a boat. It's not, it's a plane. But if you compare it to like the Twin Otters or, yeah. um, you know, the Cessna Caravans, which very much look like aircraft with floats, this looks much more like a boat with wings. So you've kind of gone really into the naval architecture to yeah. design the hull, haven't you? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes, you're absolutely right. It is a flying boat. And we, there's nothing to be ashamed of here because flying boats were the most dominant aircraft from the, in the 1920s and 30s of the last uh, century. As we remember the famous Howard Hughes played by Leonardo DiCaprio in the movie Aviator and the biggest uh, flying boat ever. Um, something has changed and we have to look at the history that then of course the jet era came, the World War II where we had suddenly had the infrastructure and people wanted to fly higher and faster and, and further. And, and this particular market has been forgotten. You're absolutely right when we compare the flying boats with the aircraft with floats, 
there is a strike in visual difference. Now, there's not only visual difference, there is a huge technical difference in terms of operational. A flying, uh, an aircraft with floats is a land-based aircraft adapted to water. That means that it brings a lot of disadvantages. Having floats is actually uh, a, of course, additional weight, clearly, but there's limitations on using the floats because the aircraft is sitting uh, at the height, so at, at the height of the of the floats themselves, a little bit higher, right, than the contact point with the water. That means that the limitation is when the when the um, the weather changes and you start to get the waves or you want to operate it in the open sea, there is this lateral movement of the aircraft. And when the ma- when this movement is too strong, therefore, the, because the wave is too high, the aircraft will plunge and dive into the, into the water. Now, a flying boat design uh, eliminates that issue because the flying boat design, the boat cuts the wave, therefore allowing for operations in a much wider parameters. So when we're talking about the flying uh, the aircraft with floaters, the the wave height limitation is very simple to calculate. You take the height of the floats themselves and you divide it by half. So if we're talking a, a, a two feet uh, floater, one foot is the biggest or the, 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 the highest wave the aircraft sh- can operate um, mm. safely. Not a lot. Fly, not <laughs> a lot. That is why the limitation of using seaplanes are quite st- quite strong in closed areas, in closed bays where there's not a lot of height, or waves, and not a lot of storm. Now, uh, in our case, this flying bo- our flying boat is designed to operate up to 1.2 meter wave height, wow. which is open, which is open sea, which means that you can operate it uh, for. For example, for rescue, research, rescue operations, if necessary. Um, but it also means that uh, when other operators with other, with other aircraft have to be moored, because the weather doesn't allow for, for the performance of the aircraft, the passengers are waiting, our aircraft keeps flying, and our operators and our customers I keep uh, operating their aircraft. Uh, that also means that suddenly they can go into certain areas where they couldn't go before because they, they, technically they couldn't. And now suddenly can, they can think about routes that were unavailable before and now they're available. So our whole approach to design is that, uh, I like to call it, we, we're designing a Swiss knife of an aircraft. <laughs> uh, being a Swiss company, I think it's kind of ironic. But the idea here is to build a designed aircraft that is simple, that is uh, has very low direct operating costs and can operate anywhere possibly um, to or to a much bigger extent uh, than 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 the current uh, aircraft. And this uh, most of it comes from from designing the flying boat. Mm. Well, it's a great looking aircraft and I can see that it's really gone back to the roots of the flying boat. But I Mm. guess what most of our watchers will want to know is what's the passenger experience going to be like? So we know you've got 19 passengers on board, but Mm. is this like a business class thing or how is it going to be inside? Well, the 19 passenger aircraft, the fact that it's 19 passenger is limited by part 23 uh, regulations. Um, There's a specific reason why we're going with part 23. First of all, is of course uh, uh, the cost for design. And it's not the foremost, but it's one of the important um, factors is the cost of the design part 23, part 24, part 25 aircraft. Once you go above it, your costs again increase X factor twice, three times, etc. And those costs will ultimately be put on the operator. Now, considering that where our operators are not going to be huge commercial air, uh, airliners, uh, we need to think about their capitals and their capex mm-hmm. going into this. Secondly, going bigger than 19 passengers is meaning a design in the bigger aircraft and be limiting our aircraft to be operated in wider areas and wider bays. So we will be cutting off uh, a big portion of the possible market from 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 the operations of this aircraft, um, this is what this is the reasons why we kept we we are keeping nineteen passengers, uh, two or one pilots, and uh, 
uh, up to two crew if if that's necessary by the for the operator. Having said that, being a flying ball design of a very large uh, fuselage, the experience of the passenger in economy class, and economy class is 19 passengers, uh, would be uh, as almost as a Boeing 777 business class. This is very, very wide aircraft uh, for the stability, certainly underwater, uh, which allows us to place very large uh, seats. Uh, but all of this volume allows us for also to work uh, towards uh, different possibilities for cabins. So we're talking about 19 passengers for economy. We're talking about nine passengers, for example, for, for, for business or six for VIPs. Mm-hmm. It is possible then, again, going into special uh, missions, uh, medivac uh, aircraft with a lot of equipment, uh, leisure uh, diving, for example, imagine you're taking the aircraft somewhere in the barrier reef in Australia. You, you dive right from the aircraft and you go back to the aircraft to fly to fly back. And there is enough space to put the tanks, to put all the equipment to, to support those oxygen tanks, etc., etc., etc. So the experience uh, of the aircraft is going to be something that 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 again going back to 20s and the 30s and the passengers of those 20s 30s would have experienced but we haven't experienced in our lifetime yet volume and this the possibility and this uh, very comfortable experience for the passengers sounds fabulous and i'm a i'm a diver myself so i can't imagine anything better than going to a remote reef somewhere and diving straight from a seaplane how awesome would yes. that be and additionally um already in the design what we're thinking is is we are uh, our chief industrial designer, Mr. Uh, Signor Maspinucci, who is a very well-known designer uh, in aviation. Uh, he's thinking his approach is passenger experience, and I'm very glad that you said it, passenger experience. So he's thinking about little things. He's even thinking about the size of the windows. Mm-hmm. As an unpressurized aircraft that is or will be uh, used in a lot of very picturesque areas of the world, whether it's Thailand or Africa or Amazon rivers. Um, it is a shame that the passenger cannot really experience and look at all of this. Mm. So so already at the design stage, we're increasing uh, our windows uh, almost twice the size so that the the, the passenger has an incredible view of everything that's going on behind him, uh, below him, sorry. Um, and of course, as I mentioned, unpressurized aircraft at low altitude, there is there will definitely be something to see, and we just provide the tool for it. Excellent! Oh, I can't wait to have a fly when it's uh, when it's ready. Thank you. Let's talk about the market demand for this sort of mm-hmm. airplane, though. So you have already had some orders in. Um, yeah. Meher in India for fifty, yeah. Gayo Aviation yeah. for ten. Um, yeah. What do you see as the demand for this type of aircraft? Have you done the numbers? Well, let me start with that. We came out of stealth mode in November of uh, last year. So it's only been uh, 11 months. Mm. So we, we've been able to secure order for 60 aircraft only in 11 months. And this shows that that the need is there and the market is there. Moreover, I'd like to, to add that uh, at the Passing Le Bourget show in, uh, in, in May, um, our competitors has... has um, presented a new generation twin order, which was updated to avionics. Um, the aircraft is still the same. It's a metal aircraft on floats. Uh, yet they were able to secure, if I'm not wrong, 120 orders. Mm, that just all announced shows at that... the same press conference, which was a lot of work for us. <laughs> ah, well, so that also means that despite the fact that those are quite outdated, very good with all respect, but quite outdated uh, aircraft, the need is there from the existing operators. And and uh, this operator is seeing enormous potential. Moreover, as I mentioned before, if we're talking about uh, increasing that market itself, um, expanding it, it is very hard to assess what was going to be the, the, the demand from the market. We can only see and say about the, the potential because of the population. Now, if we know um, India is certainly going uh, going towards this direction because they have opened in 2018, if I believe, 94 routes. 
mm. uh, water to water to to increase regional mobility and start traveling people within regions or inter regions interstate. Yet, the local population is certainly is a bit uh, challenged with uh, with the costs of the twin orders. Now, once we introduce our aircraft and the tickets drop from two hundred fifty dollars, let's put it this way, to fifty dollars. How many more people will be suddenly consider this as a viable option? Mm. And let's say 5%, for example, right? 5% is 75 million people. If That's I'm not a big mistaken. 5%. <laughs> Now, cons let's consider it further. Indonesia, Philippines, Malaysia, all these countries that are certainly increasing in, 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 in their development, And they don't have any choice because right now the only choice to travel between islands is taking the boat, which takes a very, very long time. There, certainly the states, they're interested in seaplane operations because they don't have to A, invest huge amount of money in building the airports mm. in, at the land that is very scarce and therefore very precious. Uh, and B, Any construction of the airport is a reversible ecological impact. So they, so by using seaplanes, they're killing two birds with one stone. No ecological impact from the airports and no expenditure, financial expenditure for it. So they can use this money somewhere else. But what do you provide? You provide for alternative to the boats for those for that population to to travel between islands, go visit their relatives, or or go on holidays or whatnot, or go to the international airport as a as a, as a tool for the called the last uh, the last leg or the first leg, right? Yeah. How can we quantify five percent of uh, another seven hundred million people there? Right. <laughs> so when we're talking about Uh, uh, general development of the seaplane market, what we're saying is that this is suddenly a tool to capture that passenger flow, which is in the hundreds of millions of people around the world that were not were unable to afford it before. So, so it is really hard to quantify what is going to be. If we're being, um, if we take a reservation, if and we're being very pessimistic and we're saying five percent, that's five percent, as we mentioned, is huge amount of people from the point of view of existing operators uh, we believe that uh, for in the next five years we're going to see about four to five hundred uh, orders of various uh, seaplanes from the existing operators solid that number is, just to begin with isn't it <laughs> that is a solid number but let's let's consider this that trans Maldivian airlines the famous I think they they had 61 planes only last year and they already did 69 something mm. like that so they they and again these are all twin orders uh you know with all the deficiencies they have and and um with the high cost etc so imagine they provide them alternative but but all those countries they they see the development of their population they see the certain sudden need for for regional air mobility Uh, and then they're faced with a choice. And I think here, when you're presented with the facts, the, fa the choices are quite simple. Mm. So you talked about not needing an airport. I guess all you need really is a dock. Um, but you must need some infrastructure there. So how are you going to get over the challenge yeah. of being able to recharge the plane when it gets to where it wants to go? That's a great question. Certainly, the, the, when we're talking about the planned routes, commercial routes, where you have point A, point B that are... Or, C as well, which are well known, you have to a either at the beginning plan routes to go and come back, so it's a quite short distance, or you'll need to put charging stations on both. How do we charge? There's two ways. If you have uh, uh, if you have access to the shore, you place a uh, a charging container that is fed with electricity from two points. One is the electrical grid. And second is their own uh, electric um, manufacturing, uh, most probably solar stations. Mm. If we're talking about water, again, the technology is already there. And uh, we put floater, floating solar stations. Oh, cool. They already exist. And in Mal Trans Maldives, uh, Maldives is actually at the forefront of it. 
an Austrian company. Uh, they've built over the last se- over the last several years. They've built up to thirty gigawatts of energy, of floating energy in Maldives to provide electricity for hotels and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So the technology is already there and mm. it's already available and it's already being used. Therefore, if if a, a local country uh, is saying, okay, we don't want to you get from the grid, we want you to be in the water, no problem. You place in one place, in point A and in point B, solar stations that provide the energy to the capacitor and then capa- and then the aircraft is uh, charged from the capacitor whether it's directly or it's via uh, batteries on boats so mm. a battery boat that that charges one and the capacitor comes to the aircraft charges etc 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 but let's not forget that we're talking about costs but there's another factor to it which is the the sustainability factor when you are Certainly, you are fueling your aircraft in the water. The fuel has has a habit to run away, and that all that fuel goes into the water. Not good mm-hmm. for sustainability. Electricity, there is nothing. There is no oil. There is no fuel dropping. Therefore, there is no ecological impact. Secondly, uh, when we come, for example, in Europe here, and especially in Northern Europe, we have a very strong. Uh, environmental regulations that will only be stronger and stronger with years. Uh, here in Switzerland, for example, uh, we have extremely strong environmental regulations that prevent using uh, lakes for uh, aviation. Those are comprised of the two. One is the physical pollution of oil and petrol, as I just mentioned. The other is called the noise pollution mm. because the propellers are too too loud. This is also one of the advantages of having small propellers because they produce less less uh, noise and suddenly you are within the environmental regulations parameters where you can operate and and have the possibility to operate in in northern europe so sustainability factor is a is a is a great factor i we don't put it as a as a cornerstone as the important most important no the most important is to decrease operation costs but by the way it's a fully sustainable aircraft which is only uh provides uh, additional advantages. Mm. I can see a point in the future where, you know, operators won't be allowed to launch new services unless they've got a sustainable aircraft. So this is kind of future-proofing this design for these future markets, Uh, right? Unfortunately for some countries, uh, or fortunately maybe for them, uh, this is already existing in, uh, if I'm not mistaken, Norway and Sweden, uh, they already have a plan by 2030, 2035, you are just not allowed to use combustion engine uh, aircraft on water. Simple as that. Mm. So a lot of other countries will slowly but but follow suit. The the answer is right here: electrical uh, electrical airplane. The original question: uh, the ground equipment or certainly will be needed, uh, but it's not comparable to building a, a concrete runway. Mm. Um, not even close. As you correctly stated, what you would need, you would need a dock or a pontoon. This this dock can be, again, made from sustainable uh, materials, wood, recycled plastic, whatever. Um, and you would need um, quite minimum uh, infrastructure in terms of the charging station, uh, the capacitor, and whatever produces uh, the energy for, for the capacitor. In our case, in, for now, it's electric, uh, sorry, it's a solar uh, stations, solar panels. Mm. Cool. So you have a whole ecosystem localized, uh, producing energy, providing energy for the aircraft and the aircraft itself all together in one little place. And you didn't need to spend billions on building concrete uh, concrete uh, runways. And obviously there's no sustainable impact on it. Mm. Secondly, What's very important is that uh, uh, we have talked about it, that we're designing an aircraft made of fiberglass composite with uh, with certain elements inside that's going to be carbon and color, but not the outside. The reason for it is the cost for repairment. The cost for reparations for carbon uh, or um, Kevlar is very expensive, much more expensive than the fiberglass. Fiberglass reparation is very simple, very quick. You just need heat. And you can actually train local people to uh, to perform that kind of work. It's like patching jeans or your trousers, right? 
uh, a little bit of training and you can do it. This is advan- this is advantages. But why fiberglass composite? Because fiberglass composite doesn't rust. Mm. <laughs> and why when you I mean it's quite simple. It's light, it's cheap, it's easy to maintain, easy to repair, and it doesn't rust. So it doesn't require everyday cleaning like the twin orders and the caravans of today. Again, mm. providing a direct economic benefit for the operator. And that's the, the cornerstone of everything. Because our approach is that operators are customers. So we need to make a product for them. What is the best product so they can A, attract the passenger, B, uh, keep the passenger, and C, uh, keep expanding their business. And uh, this is what we believe we'll be able to achieve with this aircraft. Lovely. Thank you. It sounds such an elegant solution. And you guys have already announced that Honeywell is going to be a supplier for a bunch of the stuff Correct. that you need for the plane. Correct. Are there going to be more supplier announcements or do you have everything you need in order to move forward with the aircraft now? No, we we are still uh, looking at the power plants, at the motors. We're still looking at the batteries, but batteries, we're, we're almost there. Um, to be fair, uh, we're looking at the props. Uh, Honeywell is going to be supplying us with their avionics. Mm-hmm. And with together with Honeywell, we're developing two things. Uh, one is uh, a, a human machine interface for uh, taxi and water, which is basically how a pilot performs single-handedly without without anyone else when he's in taxi in the water. How does the this avionics talk to him and he talks to the avionics? So we need to create a system which it makes it very very easy. To navigate this aircraft underwater, uh, consider that sometimes this aircraft is going to go backwards because um, oh. it's important. So what you do is uh, uh, the the side uh, props are having reversed, the side governors. So when you put them aside, one a if you if they're not uh, synchronized and one is forward, one that is backwards, you can. Turn around, you're on the axis. Oh, cool! Right, so <laughs> that means if you arrive into a certain river. You turn around your own axis and you take off, right? Therefore, increasing your parameters, operational parameters, what we call. This is something that a, a floater plant cannot do because they have to take a big turnaround. Mm. Secondly, if you're going, for example, in a ramp for disembarking, embarking passage, you go on the ramp, turn on the river, you got it, everybody's in, you reverse into the water, back up, like you back up your car in the parking, you have a camera inside, video camera to take a look what's uh, what's what's <laughs> in the back. You back up, maybe we'll put a signal just for fun. Beep, 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 beep. Beep, beep, beep. <laughs> Caution, this vehicle is reversing. Yes, <laughs> reverse and you take off. Again, increasing for possibilities for operators to operate in different parameters, in different environments, different areas. Uh, so uh, this is something uh, that we're working together with, with Honeywell on developing this human machine interface, how to how to interact with the avionics so that uh, one single pilot has uh, a full access to all the information and all the tools and all the controls of the aircraft at any time. Uh, why I say one single pilot? Because uh, we believe that Honeywell has the, the weight and, and, and the impact within the FAA to certify their avionics to be performed by one pilot instead of two commercial purposes. We believe they have the, uh, uh, all the tools necessary to push through the possibility through building a very robust and, and, and um, uh, reliable uh, avionics so that FAA uh, allows for this aircraft to be used by one pilot, which again decreases the operating costs mm. for, our, for our operators. Uh, because as we know now, pilots is one of the main costs for for any aircraft. Now, um, another thing which has never been done before, and this is going to be quite challenging, is automatic takeoff and landing underwater. Wow! And this hasn't been done yet. Uh, we think the technology is there already to to do it. We have ideas how to do it, and this is something we're going to be doing together with Honeywell as the first ever aircraft that. Uh, automatic takeoff and landing mm. hopefully with one pilot 
kudos for that definitely i mean you know we've seen the a350 doing automatic takeoffs and landings but landing a much smaller plane onto water is a completely different ball game so completely completely different challenge because the autopilot has to consider uh, a lot of factors wind wave direction wave height he has also to see it because again uh, leaders and, and older raiders we have water, it can be reflective or it can be on the contrary, some other technologies that will not see the water itself. So these are these are the, the challenges we have to see. And of course, the, the mathematics behind it as well. Um, but I think we'll be able to do it. Mm. So what's the roadmap from here? Where are you on the certification journey so far? And, you know, well, what's the outlook from here? Let's let's uh, separate those into several factors. Certification. <laughs> certification so let's start with that certification is something that you start before you start the design of the aircraft actually this is something that comes only from experience and you start writing what's called a certification basis which means you start a you and this is this is let's say a free lesson to the to the new designers first thing you do open the book open easa nfa regulations on the design and look what is written there what are the parameters of your aircraft is your aircraft that you have in your mind will be according to those parameters or not? Because if not, you have to rethink it. So mm. first, first thing first, open the book, look into it. Now, thankfully, uh, 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 the regulations for seaplanes have been around for many years, unlike, for example, EVTOLs or some other new um, aircraft. We start thinking, what does, how does the aircraft perform, what it needs to perform, how it needs to perform it, where it needs to perform it, and it's according to re regulations. Okay, yes, this, this, this. Then we write certification basis for propellers, for engines, for batteries, for, for the boat, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And this has already been done. Most of it has been already done. So it's, it's, it's a internal documentation which outlines all the technical parameters of each element that will go into the design. And then once that is ready, you start assembling them together into a final uh, final aircraft. Uh, so this is a certification. And we've already certainly started certification basis for many of the components. Another part is the development of the manufacturing facilities. This has, uh, we haven't started yet. We've only started the design uh, of the manufacturing facilities that's going to be built here in Switzerland in uh, Swiss Aeropol is the fastest developing airspace cluster in Switzerland, uh, specializing in, in aviation. Um, and uh, as some of us, we have fantastic, uh, fantastic support from, from the government of Switzerland. Uh, we're located there, and this is where it's going to be uh, final assembly, the aircraft. Um, now, of course, uh, the aircraft, a lot of components will have to be supplied by third parties. 50% of any manufacturing is a good work for suppliers. You need your parts on time or better already stored in the warehouse, ready to go whenever you need them. Every half an hour, one hour late or one day late will then cascadedly increase the delivery time. So it's very, very important to, to work, to choose carefully your suppliers and work with the suppliers that you know will be able to supply you on time with the, with the goods of or necessary quality and safety standards. Um, Again, it's a little bit easier for us because we have built many aircraft before our team and therefore we know all the uh, hidden obstacles. And we've, we've made the mistakes before, so we know how to overcome them and actually not, not have them from the, from the get-go. Our general uh, timeline is uh, 2025, a take a, a ultra-light amphibian two-seater aircraft. Uh, install into it uh, one power plant, what we call power plant. Power plant is a uh, battery pack, engine, governor, and and the prop, right? Mm -hmm. So since we have eight on the aircraft, one of them as a whole will go to start testing many, many, many hours flying and see how it performs, et cetera, et cetera. Our advantages is we take in the aircraft that we've built ourselves and we, we, there are many of them flying around the world. So we have thousands of hours of already data and we know this aircraft inside out. Therefore, any deviation from normal operations is a raw data that we get based on the electrical propulsion. And this is the advantages, the advantage we have is that we able 
to use what we have done before and, and, and decrease certain work in terms of time consumption because we've already done this before on, on, on a combustion engine aircraft. So 2025 uh, ultralight aircraft, mm -hmm. uh, probably uh, in the 24, maybe 25 uh, uh, flying model just to check out, uh, finalize the hydrodynamics of it. Uh, I believe in 2027, we'll be able to provide uh, the necessary aircraft for regulators to start breaking them, disassembling them and breaking them again. If, if you've ever been this, to this, you know. <laughs> and and uh, our plan is to deliver first aircraft, uh, hopefully already certified, um, in uh, May uh, 2029. So six years from now. Now... If that's not the case, then we'll have to push it to 2030. Mm. But uh, the pl the plan is per now is, uh, yes, Guy Aviation, uh, Lebouche 2029. Fabulous. It's so nice. And it's actually very refreshing to speak to somebody that clearly had so much experience in certifying building aircraft. You know, a lot of startups kind of, you, you can tell they haven't had the blinkers off yet. You know, they're still a bit thinking, oh, yeah, we'll get it all done in two years and this will be easy. But I can tell that you've been through this a lot before and that you've got all that knowledge to use up with this project. Well, I, I'm afraid in aviation, the, the problem here, if those dreamers take their blinkers off, their hands will drop and they will not <laughs> uh, do it. So we need dreamers. We need dreamers. They need their experience. They, they need their falls. Uh, then, of course, to move from dreamers to to doers, let's put it this way. But uh, I would not discourage any dreamers. If you have a dream, if you think in the aircraft, go do it. Just open the book, look at the book first. That's, <laughs> that's rule number one, look at the book. Because what's going to happen is that where, where you don't want to be, you don't want to spend uh, millions of dollars. And, in, and there's not something you can do faster. Again, developing the aircraft, it's, it doesn't matter how many engineers you, you can have a thousand engineers and the still the process is going to be the same because at some sort at some point you're going to have start diminishing returns and and the amount of genius doesn't change anything and it will not increase uh or decrease actually the the amount of certification time you needed so make sure that your aircraft or your vehicle is within the parameters open the book look at it and then make the plan yeah Read the book, everyone, for sure. George, you've been so generous with your time. We've gone way over the time that I said we'd have you for today. So thank you for a start. Um, just to finish up, though, I understand you guys will be at Dubai Air Show. Um, what can people that are visiting the show expect from Jector? Oh, I think you, I, they can look at our uh, models. Uh, first of all, of course, the outside model. But I think they'll be very interesting to see the model of the interior. Uh, where you can, they can see how much space it, it has, what kind of uh, possibilities of compositions we can have. We're also going to have a VR where you can come uh, and actually walk through the aircraft and look at the design of the aircraft from the inside. I think it's going to be very interesting. And certainly don't hesitate to talk to me or to my colleagues about anything you want about this aircraft and our vision on how we can uh, implement uh, amphibian aircraft around the world uh, in the future, in the near future, and really... I don't want to say revolutionize because it's a term that is being coined too much. Evolutionize oh, I like the, it. Regional, the regional air market uh, and really take it to the new heights of uh, providing uh, aviation for, for passengers in every part of the world. Excellent thought to leave us on. Thanks, George. Well, best of luck with Dubai okay. Air Show and thanks for your time thank on you. the show today. John, thank you very much. I really hope to see you in Dubai at our booth at the Swiss Pavilion. Please pa pass by. Uh, I'll be very glad to, to tell you everything and show you everything. I think you'll be very pleasantly surprised. And uh, just maybe grab a coffee and talk about all things aviation. Definitely. Will do. Thanks, George. Thank you very much. In addition to our daily YouTube videos, Simple Flying publishes over 150 articles every week. If you're looking for the latest aviation news and insights, visit simpleflying.com.